Hey students, we are almost to the part of the course, at least in the lecture part, where we can talk about inferential statistics. Uh, that said, we might not necessarily have the tools yet to go fully into the mathematical discussion of inferential statistics. So uh, in this series of lab lectures, I'm going to talk about computational approaches to inferential statistics, and hopefully these uh, discussions about the computational methods may give you an intuition to the more mathematical methods and also just give you a better intuition of what we're doing in statistical inference. And in addition to these methods being instructive and also not requiring much probability theory um, or much discussion about probability, they are genuinely useful because the computational methods are generally quite robust and make very few assumptions about the distribution from which your data came from. So we can use these computational methods and we can use them, in fact, in the real world. So being aware of them is genuinely useful. All right, let's get started with the notion of simulation. We let x1 be a normal random variable with mean 100 and standard deviation 16. So uh, uh, we know, or actually not just x1, xi. We know that if xi are random variables, the sample mean will follow a normal distribution. Um, and it will be, it's, it, it is its own random variable. And uh, it's, um, it, it is a random variable. It has a distribution. Uh, and we would like to simulate the distribution of the sample mean. By simulate, we mean uh, we're working with random data, uh, we are generating random samples, and computing random sample means from random samples that we are generating on a computer. So, hence the term simulation, because these aren't real samples. Uh, so you're simulating samples, and then you're studying the behavior of the sample mean on the simulated data sets. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, run this seed, but I don't really know how much it matters. Um, uh, let's suppose we wanted to simulate a single sample mean uh, for our normally distributed data with mean 100, standard deviation 16. How can we do that? We create a random data set using R norm. Remember what R norm does? Uh, here we've created a data set of size 10, it's mean is 100 and standard deviation 16, and it's coming from a normal distribution. And then I'm going to compute the mean of this random data set, which is gonna be 101, which is pretty close to the actual mean of 100. We know for a fact that the true mean is 100 because we said so when we generated the data set, that we said the mean is 100. So the mean of the random, of the random data set is 101, which seems rather reasonable. So it's not 100 though, which, uh, it's, and, and by the way, just, just, uh, continuing on with that point, um, the fact that we know what the mean is when we're doing simulations, we're doing them when we know what the true parameters of the population are. Since we know the truth, then we can better study the properties of estimators. So simulations are, um, all, are a way for us to study and understand the properties of estimators and uh, other statistical methods, uh, like any, any sort of hypothesis test or confidence intervals, stuff like that. We are using the simulations to study their properties, which means that we know what the truth is. Okay. Um, all right. So we know, so the mean did not get the right number, but is it close to the truth? Well, that's hard to say because we need to know um, what it means to be close. Like 101 could be close. It also might not be close. It kind of depends on what exactly close means. Uh, if your, if your standard deviation were 0 0.1, then 101 actually doesn't look all that close at all. Uh, whereas if your standard deviation is a thousand, then 101 is actually extremely close. So we need to, uh, better study how close the mean tends to be to the uh, sample standard deviation. And here's one way to do that. What we're going to do is generate a lot of data sets and compute the means for each of those data sets. So here is a line that does so. Um, we've got S apply one to 100. We have a function 
And what this function does is, com is generate a random data set of length 10 and then compute its mean. And that function must be must have a parameter that one of these numbers can be fed into because that's how sapply works. The only thing though is we never actually use that parameter. That parameter is a placeholder. Like we never actually need that parameter in the actual function call. So we give it a parameter, but I called it throwaway because I don't actually need it. That, that parameter is just going to be thrown away. And this does in fact work. So if we look at sim means... Uh, we have simulated means. So it did work. It, it, it created um, a data set of simulated means for us. It's just a little unfortunate that these uh, that we had to use a rather verbose function call that sapply isn't actually meant for this purpose um, of uh, doing something just over and over again and the operation is essentially the same. There's actually a function called replicate that we can use instead that is um, uh, at least better. It, it's des it's designed to actually do this. Like its interface is better suited to what we want to do, which is repeat some operation so many times. And generally when we're using replicate, I would say that we're using replicate to work with simulations. I feel like replicate is a simulation function because it's saying do some uh, operation so many times and just repeat that operation. So it's probably um, meant specifically for simulations. All right, but whatever. In the end, we did this procedure of creating a data set of length 10 with mean 100 standard deviation 16 and then computing its mean 100 times. And then in the end, we end up with a data set of simulated means. And they're quite nice. All right. Um, so, uh, looking at the means, we do see a lot of variability. Like, some of them are... Well, this mean, for example, is 111. This means 101. This one's 97. Uh, I bet that somewhere there's probably a mean that's less than... Oh, yeah, here's 93. 93 seems a little distant from the truth of 100. So, actually, there's quite a bit of variability in these means. So, um, what would happen if we were to increase our sample size well let's uh, investigate uh, here are our simulated means where we increase the sample size from 10 to 20 uh, all right so all right we got something here uh, maybe we should look at summaries of these data sets so summary of sim means all right let's uh, examine this so in the first case when the sample size was 10 the smallest number we got was 89.61 the largest was 112 if we go to sim means 2 Okay, the minimum and the maximum have gotten closer. The qu the quartiles have gotten closer to the truth of 100. Uh, the mean and the me the median and the mean, they were already pretty close. Actually, the median got a little further away from the truth. Um, and so did the mean, too, for that matter. But that's probably just due to some natural variability. I feel like the better uh, statistics that are giving us a sense of how close these simulated means are to the truth are probably going to be the min, max, and first and third quartiles. Okay. Uh, why? Hmm. Looks like I accidentally edited something. Okay. Uh, what if we? Um, uh, all right. So, um, what if we were to keep going like this? Um, we could do simulated means for uh, sample sizes of fifty and a hundred. And uh, I wonder what the summary statistics for those look like. Uh, so sim means three all right so looks like the minimum and the maximum got a little narrower uh, the maximum got quite narrower um first and third quartiles are narrower uh median and mean eh, they're about the same uh let's do sim means four and look at this hmm yeah the you still see compression on the extrema so the minimum and maximum are getting even closer the quartiles are getting even closer uh, the mean and the median, they're still, like, pretty close to 100, but it's in the quartiles and the minimum and maxima that I'm most interested in. Uh, let's create box plots that are comparing the distributions of these means. And, uh, looking at these box plots, you do see the box plots converging to the truth. Let's even throw in a line that, uh, tells us what the truth is. This blue line corresponds... Uh, to the true mean. 
and it looks like these estimators are getting closer and closer to the truth. Um, and it's and it's not shock. We also do see that they tend to be very close to the truth in their center. So their means tend to be very close. Uh, we can understand this to mean that uh, these estimators, at least approximately, and actually it's true theoretically, these estimators appear to be unbiased. So unbiasedness means that the expected value of an estimator is equal to its uh it's equal to the thing it's trying to estimate. So since x bar is trying to estimate mu, what we're seeing here is that the expected value of x bar is mu and it's centered around the correct quantity. So these are unbiased estimators for the mean. And also what we're seeing an is uh, that they tend to get rather close to the mean. So let's uh, actually compare the mean to another competing statistic to estimate the parameter mu of a normal distribution, which is the median, because the mean and the median for a normal distribution are the same. So I will create data sets of medians, like so. The, th this code is essentially what I had before, but I replaced the function mean with the function median. Right, and uh, we could even look at some of the summary statistics for these uh, data sets. So sim medians. All right, so let's see. Uh, the minima and the maxima are quite large. The first and third quartiles are far away, and the median and mean appear to be about about uh, right though. Uh, if we were to go to two, uh, getting closer, but actually these are not as close as the corresponding means. Uh, in fact, they're quite distant when uh, when compared to those means. The, it looks like those uh, quartiles and maximum minima are rather far away. So let's go to four. Yeah, it's 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 getting closer, but not as fast as the mean was. Or I don't know, the quartiles might be. I'm not really sure. Uh, let's create um, a visualization to compare the medians and the means. So what I'm going to do is create a data frame uh, that's um, that's uh, that's containing the means and the medians. And here's the uh, uh, here's what the data set looks like. Uh, this uh, data frame. So we have the statistic, we have the type of statistic, and then we have the sample size for that statistic. Those are our three columns. Um, all right, so uh, that was created using this uh, function call. You can study it if you wish. Um, notice that I encoded the uh, sample sizes as factor variables because I would much prefer to represent these as categorical type variables. All right, um, now let's create a plot using ggplot. Uh, so y will be the statistic. Uh, the statistics value x will be the type of statistic so we're going to split up based on the type uh we're also going to use different colors for different types and we're also going to use different fill colors for different types uh we're going to have um a line at 100 to represent the truth um we're going to create a violin plot uh for our data sets and we're also going to include um a statistical summary that includes the median and also a high and low number for those data sets. We're going to break up in a facet grid based off of the sample size so that we have different plots for each uh, sample size. Uh, I want uh, a black and white theme because I actually prefer that to the gray theme. I know that Tufty had his arguments for the for the gray theme, and I, I'm just not a fan. So uh, here is my ggplot. And it does stuff, and we get to wait. And look at that. Here we are. Here is our plot. What do we think about this? So the uh, colors were automatically picked. We can we get automatically a legend. Uh, pink corresponds to mean, and this blue-green color uh, corresponds to the uh, median. And at some level, there, this is kind of an eye. I this is in the eye of the beholder. But here's what I see. This is how I'm interpreting this. And admittedly, my judgment is skewed because I know what the theory says. Um, but to me, it looks to me like the medians tend to be more spread out than the means. Uh, so this median is certainly more spread out. We actually got something really extreme. Uh, so this is 
more spread out than the mean. This is a bit more spread out than the mean and so on. So it looks to me like, in general, the mean tends to be more concentrated than the median. All right. So uh, there's more variance in the median than the mean. So what that means is the median is not an estimator that is minimum variance. What does it mean to be minimum variance? We prefer estimators for statistics that have the smallest variance possible because we don't want, while it's nice that a statistic um, is, um, while it's nice that a statistic is unbiased and that its expected value is equal to the truth, that's also true. Like, here's an unbiased estimator for the mean. The first observation in your data set. Its expected value is mu. It's unbiased. So unbiasedness on its own is not sufficient to describe what makes a good estimator. We have a couple parameters too. Uh, one could potentially be consistency. Uh, or the, the idea that the estimator uh, will converge in some sense to the truth as you increase your sample size. And uh, clearly the first observation is not consistent. If we're like, that doesn't actually care about the size of our data set, right? On the other hand, uh, here's another, it, well, okay. If that's the case, then we wouldn't use the first observation. Our data set would be ruled out by the consistency criterion, but not the estimator that uses half of our data set and then computes the mean of half the data set. That would not be ruled out because that is consistent. Um, it is still essentially a mean. It's just throwing out half of your data. Okay, um, so consistency on its own um, is uh, not a sufficient uh, criterion for what makes a good estimator. Uh, and by the way, sometimes we prefer consistent estimators to unbiased estimators. So... Um, or estimators, it, it may not necessarily be possible to get an unbiased estimator. There might, uh, or you could get it, but it's really hard and more work than necessary and uh, introduces other types of problems. So we might actually drop the unbiased criterion when evaluating a statistic saying, actually, all we really care about is consistency. All right. Um, but still, I've still left open this issue that Maybe there are consistent estimators that um, that seem a little silly, like just throwing out half of your data set and then computing the mean of the other half. It, that seems wasteful. Why is it that we don't want that estimator? Well, the reason why is because that estimator is not minimum variance. Um, we could get more information about the mean and an estimator with a smaller variance if we were to use the full sample. So we should try to get an estimator that has the smallest variance possible because such an estimator should be closer to the true mean. And um, it turns out, all right, so we should then use the full sample because that will minimize the variance the most if we're going to use the mean. And furthermore, it turns out that the sample mean as an estimator of the mean of a normal distribution is the minimum var variance estimator. Not just that it's es that its variance is smaller than the median, which is also a consistent uh, estimator for the mean of uh, a normal distribution, but it not not only is it uh, not only does it have a smaller variance than the median, it has the smallest variance possible of any estimator that could possibly estimate the mean. Uh, and that is a math fifty eighty topic, uh, the idea of something being minimum variance. Um, but we're just going to uh, leave that for now. Um, okay. So, um, that was all nice to study, uh, how well, um, these, uh, estimators were, um, uh, uh, are, are doing to estimate the truth. Uh, but we're also interested in whether data and what the distribution of these estimators are. The distribution of estimators is often used to construct confidence intervals and, um, uh, hypothesis tests. So we want to study their distribution too. Let's look at the distribution of the sample means. And what we're going to use is, what, is what's known as a QQ plot. A QQ plot, I've discussed QQ plots in the main lecture videos. So that's a good place to look um, if you want a deeper discussion of what a QQ plot is. But here is a QQ plot 
uh, for the simulated means um, when the sample size was, was it a 50? I can't quite remember uh, what it was. No, it's a hundred. Okay. So here's how a QQ plot should be read. Uh, a QQ plot compares uh, sample quantiles to theoretical quantiles for some distribution of interest. So in this case, the theoretical quantiles are the theoretical quantiles of a normal distribution. And we're comparing um, the theoretical quantile for the quantile corresponding to this smallest observation um, to the sample quantile. And if the theoretical distribution is a good fit for the sample, what we would expect to see in the QQ plot is the, uh, the points falling along a line. So the theoretical quantiles and the sample quantiles should have something very close to a linear relationship. Um, and I would, what, what exactly constitutes a linear relationship is in the eye of the beholder. And in my case, I do believe that this uh, is a linear relationship. Now I'm going to create another QQ plot for a data set that is known to not be normal. Uh, this is going to be a QQ plot for, um, for uniformly distributed data on the interval 0, 1. And we've got 100, one of the, uh, 100 of these. And then we'll add in uh, the QQ line. Oh, actually, we should have saved that data set. But okay, you can imagine that there's that we could insert a straight line to try to compare against. And what we see is this is not a straight line relationship between the data and uh, between the theoretical and sample quantiles. Instead, we are seeing this S shape that uh, not only indicates that the theoretical distribution is a bad fit for the data set, but also suggests why exactly the theoretical distribution is inappropriate. So if we're, in particular, this S shape suggests that um, the, uh, uh, the theoretical quantiles uh, tend to be much larger than what we saw for the sample quantiles than if, if this were, the, in fact, the appropriate distribution. Uh, so that's, they're much larger on the uh, left-hand side of the distribution and much smaller on the right-hand side which is suggesting that the tails of the sample uh, distribution are too light for the theoretical distribution to be truly appropriate. Uh, on the other hand, let's try maybe... Oh, this this might blow it up. Um, like, this might actually not... Oh, yeah, that's that's a... Uh, that's a little too extreme. <laughs> like, like, clearly the normal distribution's not wrong for that, but it's, like, so wrong that... that uh, that we should not that that that's probably almost a bad example um let's try instead dxp is that one or laplace is this one no okay r uh no r d um hmm what's well i guess we could use uh rt uh, so this is for a T distribution, uh, with, a, or actually let's use an exponential distribution. Uh, an exponential distribution will make my point. Okay. This is a case where we have a kind of a C shape or a cup shape. Um, um, and how you should read that is, okay. If we were to put a line here, it would, the best fitting line would probably be about here. And it suggests that the theoretical quantiles on the left hand side are too large for the theoretical distribution to be appropriate. Um, and the best fitting line would probably be running through here. So that means on the right hand side, the sample has quantiles that are too large for the theoretical distribution. So that means that the left hand tails are too light. Uh, or so the, so the theoretical distribution's left tails are too heavy and its right tails are too light. Okay, and you can also get like, for example, well, I mean, let's go back to that Arcoshi example. It this is an S shape, but a differently oriented S shape. Um, rather than being oriented like so, it's oriented well like so. So, kind of a different looking S shape, but an S shape nonetheless. This one is suggesting that the samples tails are far too heavy for the theoretical distribution to be appropriate. So these are QQ plots, um, and you can use them to judge. And it's a pure judgment call 
whether uh, the distribution of a data set is actually appropriate uh, or, or whether some theoretical distribution is actually appropriate. This looks like a straight line. So it seems like the normal distribution is a good descriptor of the distribution of the sample means, which is known to be true, right? We have, for starters, the fact that the sample mean is exactly following a normal distribution when the data set itself is normal, or at least I, uh, all throughout this entire uh, discussion, we're assuming that our uh, data set consists of independent variables, but still, um, it is known for a fact that the data, that the sample mean will follow exactly a normal distribution under those conditions. So this is not surprising that the normal distribution is uh, uh, describing um, the uh, distribution of the sample means very well. But what's a little bit more surprising, if you're not familiar with the central limit theorem, but you should be because you already watched that video, um, uh, it is a little bit more surprising that uh, the normal distribution uh, describes very well the mean of sample, uh, the, the distribution of sample means in general when there's a variance. Okay, um, so one thing that's nice about simulation is that we can use simulation to estimate probabilities that are otherwise rather difficult to compute by hand. Uh, so we simulate, we simulate the phenomena that we're curious about and how often an event happens in question. Well, oh, we, we, we count how often some, in, some event of interest happens in the data set. Like, for example, how like the sample mean is uh, within uh, one or negative one of 100 or something like that. Uh, and if done correctly, the sample proportion should approach the true probability as you do more simulations. And the accuracy of your uh, estimates depends basically on how many distributions you did. Oh, it looks like I don't have the reshape package, so I'm going to need to install that. Uh, reshape. Okay. All right. You need a crayon mirror. Okay. So, I don't know, 58. Seems nice to me. Anyway. Um, so here, what I'm looking at is I want to estimate the probability that the sample means are within one uh, of the truth, right? So what I'm actually doing here is uh, looking at the distance between the simulated means and 100, which is done with the absolute value of the simulated mean minus 100, and check when that distance is less than one. And I'm doing so for the simulated means and also for the medians, um, which... I, you can actually look up in your textbook uh, what the distribution of the sample mean is, but you can't look up the distribution of the sample median. So this is actually a probability that you currently probably don't have the ability to compute by hand. Um, it actually turns out that the median, I believe in, even in the case of normally distributed data, is um, I think it's exactly following a, a normal distribution, although it might uh, be only approximately normal. I'm not really sure. But at the very least, it's approximately normal. So, uh, and you can look up in your book, like what the distrib not in your book, but in some other resource, what the distribution of the sample median is in the case of normally distributed data, um, or at least what it should be very close to, um, and then maybe use that to get these probabilities. But you could also instead just use simulation and not have to worry about any of that. So I'm going to create... Um, a version of this data set. Here, what I have is a list. Here is a, here is the structure of the list. Uh, no, no, uh, dat list, sorry. Okay, so here's what this list consists of. It's uh, actually um, nested lists. So it's a list of two other lists. Each of those lists having length four, uh, consisting of, um, actually it just looks like they just have numbers. So then, once we have an object of this structure, we can actually melt it uh, using the melt function from the reshape package. I, I mean, the point of this lecture is not how melt works. So I guess we're just going to leave for now um, how exactly melt works. But that, um, but the result of that function call, which you can probably just look at the documentation to see how melt is working. It's a reshape too. A reshape the package reshape is quite useful so it's probably a good idea to get useful with it but it, uh, to get uh, used to it but uh it create it turned this list into this data frame uh which is uh, quite nice let's although that said i don't like the names that i came up with it with by default um 
or necessarily um, how it's representing size. Uh, so here's a better version of that data set, uh, data frame after we do some manipulations with that, changing its names, uh, changing how exactly this size uh, variable is working so that it's a, um, a factor variable as opposed to what I would guess is something numeric. Um, or it might be a character, I'm not really sure. Anyway, we now have a data set like this, and then we can create a plot. Um, and you can study the this this code right here to see how exactly it's working. Uh, maybe you would notice geom text, where uh, geom text is actually plotting text. And here is a plot for how often the mean and the median are within one of the truth, uh, the true mu of 100. So when the sample size is 10, 18% of the time, the mean is within one of the of 100, and 14% of the time, the median is. Um, for 20, 21% uh, of the time, the mean is within one, whereas only 20% of the time, the median is. Uh, for 50, 35% uh, of the time, the mean is within one. Well, only 23% of the time, the median is within one. And for 100, 50% of the time, the mean is within one, and 34% of the time, the median is within one, which is suggesting that the mean tends to be closer in literal distance to the truth. Okay. Um, uh, so suppose we uh, wanted to estimate quantiles for uh, our statistics. We could use the sample quantiles of the, of the simulated data to uh, estimate the true quantiles of a statistic and thus get some sense as to where the true parameter may lie. Uh, so here I'm doing so, uh, creating a list of uh, quantiles for each of our means. Uh, these are the 5th and 95th percentiles. And then I can per convert this into uh, a data frame using cast and melt. I actually don't want to talk too much about how these are working. Uh, just take my word that they are working the way we want them to. Uh, also change the names of the resulting data frame because I don't like its defaults. Also change how that size parameter is working. And then, in the end, when we look at the resulting data frame, this is what we get. So these are our lower and upper 5th and 95th percentiles for means and then medians. And then I create a plot. It seems like a lecture where I got like really excited about whatever it is I was talking about. Um, here's a plot where a, a straight line is drawn with the extent of the line being the 5th and 95th percentiles. And we're comparing the median to the mean. And in every case, the median appears to be more spread out in the sense that uh, its 5th and 95th percentiles are farther apart uh, than, in, than for the mean. Um, this is one weird situation. I wonder if... Are those... Are those the same? Is this one actually a little bit larger? I mean, that's weird. Uh, but it's certainly wider. In all cases, these uh, almost 90% intervals, um, uh, these uh, intervals for the median are always wider than they are for the mean. So um, it is the case that 100 is always contained in these intervals, so these intervals appear to be centered around the correct number. Uh, and, and appear to always contain the correct number. Um, that said, the median is always looking like an inferior estimator for uh, the true parameter mu than the mean. So maybe going back to some of those discussions about computing the sample mean, computing the sample median, which of these things should you use? Because it seems like both of those statistics are trying to estimate similar notions of uh, location. All right, what? and uh, here we're, we have a situation where for the population, the mean and the median are the same, which is going to be the case in general for uh, any symmetric distribution. What we have here is that in the case of normally distributed of a normal uh, of a normal population, not normal in the sense of typical, but in the, but normal in the sense that its distribution is a normal distribution. In that situation, it seems that the mean is a better estimator for the common parameter mu than the median which would then help you decide if i have the choice between the mean and the median which should i use um assuming that the mean and the population mean and median are the same if they're not the same then you should use the sample statistic that corresponds to your population statistic that you want to estimate um 
So in, in other words, never use a median to estimate a mean if the mean if the population mean and median are not the same. Um, this in this situation, when the data came from a normal distribution, the mean is the better estimator. Is that always going to be the case? The answer is no. Uh, there are some distributions for which uh, the median is the better estimator than the mean. And there are some distributions where um, neither the median nor the mean are the best estimator. For example, if you were to reparameterize the uniform distribution so that instead of having a lower bound and an upper bound, it had a center and a spread. If you're to reparameterize it that way, I believe, I actually haven't checked this out myself. Uh, I should probably double check this, but I believe that the best estimator is actually the midpoint of the range. Uh, that's actually the best. Uh, so the minimum and the maximum of the data set divided by, so add those together and then divide by two. I believe that's actually the best estimator for the mean and median. Um, so, uh, but it, it ultimately depends on your data set. And there's also this issue of robustness versus um, uh, efficiency, because in the case of a normal distribution, the mean is the more efficient estimator in the sense that it has less spread than the median. But the median uh, across distributions has pretty good, qu uh, good qualities and pretty good robustness qualities. So it's less sensitive to outliers and all that business in which case um, the median might be the more robust estimator in that it doesn't necessarily work particularly well in the case of normal data, but across distributions, if you're a little unsure about your, whether your data actually came from a normal distribution or not, it seems to be a pretty well-behaved estimator. Okay, um, so that's it for this video. Um, the uh, uh, So uh, the next video is going to be on significance testing using these uh, numerical procedures that are based just on simulation and such. All right, so I will see you there.